Good morning. It is a beautiful day. Um, how is it where you're living? How's the it's weather? It's starting to get cold here in Northern That's Virginia. That's what people talk about when they don't know what to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jake, uh, we decided to go live to talk about the debate and see, just um, share some more of our thoughts about can the Pope abrogate the 1962 missile, how we thought the Tims fared. And, um, but first, can you just give the audience a reminder on who you are and what you do? Sure. So I've been helping out with the film for a couple of years now in a variety of capacities, but uh, most of you would interact with me through email or social media. Um, I'm the communications manager. So if you've uh, received an email or Instagram message or anything like that, that's probably for me. Um, I've also helped with some of the productions and a little bit of editing. Um, so yeah, just kind of wear a lot of different hats and do whatever Cameron tells me to do. Yeah. Yeah. So th the debate I thought was, um, I mean, it was thrilling to be a part of, and uh, I have really high respect for both of those men for coming on and doing that debate. Now you'd expect me to say, but, and give, you know, some criticisms, but firstly, I just want to say that, um, respect both of them. I could have not, I could not have like gone on and debated like they did. They did a great job. Um, and I think it's also such a critical question. I think it's top of mind for a lot of traditional Catholics now. Um, yeah. you know, can the Pope just willy nilly just change around the liturgy? That's a scary thought. Um, so I've maybe I'll, I'll share a little bit about where I'm at on the issue and then you can jump in and we can I'm sure we'll touch on the debate as we go. Um, so <laughs> where, how far back do I want to go? So obviously, when you discover the Latin mass, you discover something timeless and solid and traditional. And it's a breath of fresh air because, you know, if you, like most Catholics, just travel around to different parishes, Nova Soto parishes, the the mass is different depending on your geographical parish. It's just different. It's, it's almost never the same. And the reason for that is because of the proliferation of options in the new mass. Um, the priest can do, he can ad lib. There's like six parts in the mass. He can just start adding stuff like little homilies he, he can do options with the penitential rite. um there's just a the communion prayers obviously there's options everywhere but even more than that there's there's so much flexibility with just the the form of worship just like how it's conducted and is it casual is it reverent um you know does it have crazy things in it um offensive things in it so when you find the Latin Mass, you find something very secure and sturdy. And so um, I suppose at, at first, I believe that, that the Lord would just protect the liturgy, no matter what, <laughs> no matter what Pope is in office. It's like um, in office, like we voted for him, uh, that the Lord protects the sacred liturgy because it's not our possession. Um, it's his work ultimately. And, but at the same time, then, you know, uh, the, the Francis pontificate uh, opened up a lot of questions. And then you read statements of Vatican one that seem to give him ultimate, well, he has ultimate authority, but it seems to give him full plenary power. Like absolute power is one way to read it. Um, because plenary in the dictionary means full and absolute. But on the other hand, um, to change the liturgy arbitrarily would be something that would be new. <laughs> if, if Francis were to write his own missile or to abrogate a previously you know, valid missile, he'd be doing something new that's never been done in history for the first 2000 years of church history. So would that be, is that even possible? Is it, 
possible that the Catholic Church, like we 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 stand on a solid ground as Catholics, and we you know tell our Protestant friends, you know, we're Catholic. You know, you can't change. <laughs> It, it you know who the pope who's in who's in authority doesn't just make up doctrine it's not like the mormons where they constantly you know evolve but then what is that what can we say then about the liturgy can the pope just change that um so vatican one you know gives him or recognizes he has plenary power over the disciplines of the church so where i stand right now is we need a more thorough precise definition of of um the pope's power in regard to the liturgy specifically um yes liturgy has disciplines in it but i want to read something that i just found <laughs> 15 <laughs> minutes ago um from mediator day so I, I found it in the sources of catholic dogma and it says Therefore, they wander entirely away from the true and full notion and understanding of the sacred liturgy, who consider it only as an external part of divine worship and presented to the senses, or as a kind of apparatus of ceremonial propriety, proprieties. And they no less err, who think, it, think of it as a mere compendium of laws and precepts by which the ecclesiastical hierarchy bids the sacred rites to be arranged and ordered. So, so I've, I've flip-flopped a couple times. I mean, originally when I read Vatican I, I was like, well, okay, the Pope can do it. He has the authority to do it, but maybe the Holy Spirit will just protect him from doing it or something. But then I, I thought Flanders brought up a great point that the, the mystery or the, the liturgy is not reducible to legal categories like we can come at it with a cert as a as a surgeon and just like piece it apart because then all you're left with i think is the words of institution is the hocus in um corpus ma'am is the consecration and the the proper um elements of the of the sacrament and that seems like an absurd position that that's the only unchangeable thing about the liturgy um because that would be unprecedented in the history of the church. And so where I'm at now is I think we just need a clearer definition on the Pope's authority in regard to the liturgy. And I thought, um, yeah, Gordon had some good points and Flanders had some good points, but it seemed like they didn't quite connect them until the very end of the debate. Yeah. We were just getting started. Yeah, I mean, that really could have gone on for like four or five hours. Um, those guys had a lot to say. And I know, you know, corresponding with them privately, they had a lot more sources and things they wanted to read from that they didn't even get to. Um, so I think it was like a two and a half hour show. And <laughs> really, not to be cliche, but really was just scratching the surface. I mean, this is a, a really, really deep issue. And yeah. you have to go really deep into church history to figure some of these things out. That's right. But, uh, you know, I'll just echo what some of the people on Twitter were saying. I really think Tim did a great job. Um, Wait, who? who? But, well, in the end, Tim won, though. Yeah, yeah. Tim won yeah. the debate, for sure. But Tim didn't do so hot. I think. No, I think Tim had some, yeah. Yeah, there were some serious missteps by Tim. But, you know, it is what it is. Um, yeah, I think... He's my favorite. I think a, a seminarian friend of mine uh, was saying, you know, when they're studying Vatican I and then Vatican II... He's like, man, I just, I kind of wish that the church had just never defined infallibility. Hmm. You know, it, it seems to have created more problems than, you know, the, the Pope has infallibly declared what three things, you know, in, in 2000 years. And I know infallibility is more than just, you know, ex cathedra statements mm -hmm. by the Pope, but in, in a lot of ways, from the laity's perspective, it seems like we, we didn't really need that defined. And it's, it's kind of become a trap. Like, but like you said, we, you know, we tell our Protestant friends that we stand on this solid ground and then they're looking for, oh, well, the Pope changed this or the yeah. Pope said this on an, you know, an interview on an airplane. So it, it must not be infallible. It must not be indefectible, you know, so it, it's almost like it's created this trap for us. And then everything the Pope says or does, people are attacking and Catholics are defending and it. I don't know. I mean, 
the council is definitely wiser than I am. So there, there was reason for defining <laughs> infallibility, but right. a lot of times I just think, man, if, <laughs> if we just hadn't gone there. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I'm with you. I think we need a clearer definition of it, of the Pope's authority on these things. But, you know, to, to one of the points Gordon was making, you know, it, we did change things. And the liturgy was the way that it was since 1570. And you can argue, you know, if you read any of Michael Davies' works, he argues, you know, very effectively that the liturgy has been about the same in its essential parts since the time of Gregory the Great, right? Since the like se early seventh century. Um, and there you are thing. throwing out the word essential. <laughs> right. Yeah. Here we go. We got to define. Here we go. Things. Yeah. I get what you're saying. Yeah. Go ahead. But um, one thing that Flanders was saying is that all the development up to that point, up to the 69 missile, had been organic, right? And we got in this kind of battle about, well, yep. what does that word even mean? And if I could just offer kind of like a simple, a simple explanation of how organic development had worked, it was almost always growth, right? So mm. if you read Revelation, you get these, these little bits and pieces of St. John talking, using imagery of what the liturgy was like back then, right? And that's what Scott Hahn's book, um, The Lamb's Supper, is all about, right? It's connecting the book of Revelation to the liturgy. And if, if you, you know, move from there, things are added on. So the liturgy was very simple at first. It, it really was, you know, from what we know from those early missiles, it really was the only essential part was the, the words of the consecration, which are the most ancient prayer that we have really in the church. And from there, you know, you add things. You add the intro it or the prayers at the foot of the altar or in the late 1800s, Leo the 13th mm -hmm. added the prayers after mass, right? the St. Michael prayer, we, we didn't really have this like cutting away. And I know one, one image we like to use on the mass ages team is the liturgy growing like a tree, right? Mm -hmm. So you have the trunk maybe is the, the prayer of consecration, the Roman canon, and then different branches grow out. The Kyrie grows out here. Mm -hmm. Gregorian chant grows out here. And over time they become more substantial substantially part of the tree maybe that's not the right word to use i mean just more of a full part of the tree they become bigger more solid yeah more recognizable like that is the tree that is part of the tree and i think we can all get behind that imagery of you know biological organic growth an organic thing growing and then when you when you come to the missile in 69 it just cut away. I mean, new liturgical movement had a percentage. I don't remember exactly, but it was like something like 83% of the prayers mm -hmm. that were used in the old right were removed. 87% is the new number from that. <laughs> the, the 1969 number. Yeah. Um, yeah, it seems like that that's not an organic development. Uh, organic development has this kind of feeling of growth, right? this movement, this upward movement, the tree getting taller or more growth and out. a little bit of pruning, but not, um, it, it doesn't seem to cut away these, these branches that like, have you seen those trees that <laughs> people have quote unquote trimmed, but it's to make way for like power lines. Power lines so they yeah. have like an entire, <laughs> like the middle of the tree is yeah, like gone hacked off. So, um, yeah, I think that is a good, good analogy because, um, over time the liturgy is, uh, becomes more and more itself. You know, Peter Kwasniewski makes this point that the, ch the changes become less and less s drastic and, um, the pruning becomes less and less because it becomes more and more perfect over time. Now I think Vatican II, uh, so let me let me choose my words carefully. I think the bishops of Vatican II were correct to say that it would be good to change some things about the Mass of the Ages. Now, when you say that, it's it sounds wild because when we hear of change to the Latin Mass, we think of the new Missal. But the bishops, when they read read Sacred Sanctum Concilium at Vatican II, they interpreted it to be a very conservative, limiting document. Where, yeah, maybe it'd be nice to have very, like, things like the priest and the people doing the confidior together, or the priest and the people doing the gloria together. Like, 
why does the priest say it and then the choir sings it um so uh and then maybe we could reduce some of the um repetitions but <laughs> when um when the concilium the the implementers of that document got their hands on the power they interpreted the document as far as they could go and so so um so i think over time the liturgy does get added to and pruned i think you're right to say that it's it's minimal over time it, it, but then the question is what about the the um the breviary uh, reform with saint pope pius x mm -hmm. and i know alquin reed in his book um organic development of the liturgy or i, I forgot what the title is no but, that, that's right okay he says that was the kind of first kind of unprecedented blow to the liturgy. And if you step back for a second, you know, the church moves slow. So right now we are, you know, a hundred years after St. Pope Pius X. Uh, I think that's right. 60 years after Vatican II. But if you look at church history, that's a short period of time. So it could be the fact that we're in a time that's very confusing and uncertain and a council is going to be called that's going to clarify these things and even say you know saint pope pius x did this thing wrong yeah so um, that's an interesting point that i that, that's kind of in my mind that's kind of like jumping to my conclusion right mm. so flanders and gordon were kind of arguing about what is organic right mm. and that's fine we can we can have that debate but really how it's worked in church history is that you decide a lot of these things after the fact right so like gordon's example of of the church changing the bread from leavened to unleavened you know it caused a huge problem there was a huge uproar about it people were saying the church doesn't have the authority to do that but well now a thousand years later looking back on it we with, see it's organic right and so are the changes of the 1969 missile organic you know i would argue that most of them are not and and i don't think we're going to make it a thousand years with the novus ordo to be able to look back you know i think it'll it'll die out long before then but a lot of times in church history you just don't know until after the fact people like to bring up these um these instances where a pope you know spoke heresy or or mistaught something even privately in every example that people give the pope is corrected retroactively by a future right. pope or a future council so the question of does the pope have the authority well because nobody judges the first you know the the seat of saint peter <laughs> it's it's in a way kind of a silly question right does the pope have the authority to remove the prayers at the foot of the altar well he did let's see i mean you either have to say that was right. a valid change and it therefore invalidates something about the Novus Ordo Mass, or you have to just accept we're the laity, the Pope made this change, the church has declared it as valid. Let's let's see where that goes over the next 100, 200, 300 years, which is an unsatisfying answer for sure. Yep. But, but like you said, the church moves slowly. And I, I think that that's kind of where we are until we get more clarification about it. You're, you're not going to know. So the, the Pope removes you know a branch the prayers at the altar the the prayers after mass you know whatever example you want we can all argue that it was bad or imprudent to remove that branch but that wasn't the question of the debate right mm -hmm. the question was did he have the authority to remove that branch and i i think i think you have to say yes he has the authority in the moment right so are you really going to say Paul VI didn't have the authority to sign off on the Novus Ordo Mass? Like, I don't think any of us take that position because then you're walking dangerously close to saying that the new Mass is invalid. And I think that was a point that, that Gordon was trying to make, right? If you're saying he doesn't have the authority to make these changes, well, then what do you make of the Novus Ordo? <laughs> how, do you, how do you deal with the fact that 98% of Catholics who attend Mass are attending the Novus Ordo? So that yeah, we would you know, need more tricky. categories to understand it. Like, um, let's just thought experiment it. Let's say Vatican three comes or Trent two, whatever you want to call it. Trent two. <laughs> <laughs> and uh says, okay, the, the Pope does not have the authority. I mean, it already says in the catechism that 
even this is 1125 even the supreme authority in the church may not change the liturgy arbitrarily but only in the obedience of faith and with religious respect for the mystery of the liturgy okay i'm glad that you brought that up because this is this is a point that i really when i texted you that i wanted to do this follow-up video this is like the main the main point that i want to make gordon and flanders were going back and forth flanders was using the example of the altar being ripped out and turned into a table and Gordon was using the example of the bread being changed from um, unleavened or leavened to unleavened and the chalice being removed from, you know, receiving under both species. But we didn't, so we were talking about those things in terms of organic development, but we didn't really hit on this, this quote that you just said, 1125 was used, but we didn't really talk about arbitrary, right? Yeah. So, so the chalice, let's go for the chalice example with hmm. Gordon. I see where you're going. I like yeah. it. So, so the church had a reason and, and, and defined in a, in a council later on, it was defined in Trent why the chalice was taken away, right? There were, there were at point. least two reasons. One was to combat a popular heresy. I mean, it, it showed itself time and time again throughout history that people would say the body of Christ is present under the species of the bread and the blood of Christ is present present only under the species of the wine. So you have to receive both if you want to receive body, blood, soul, and divinity. And the church has always taught that even in the smallest particle of the host or the smallest drop of the blood, the wine, Christ is fully present, body, blood, soul, and divinity. So when this heresy was rearing its head again, the church said, we're going to take the chalice away to show Sunday mass going Catholics in a tangible way all you need to receive is the bread, one species, because the body, blood, soul, and divinity is contained fully in that species. So it was a way to combat the heresy. Secondly, just practically speaking, there's a much higher chance of spilling the precious blood and particles being lost and harder to, to clean up or consume correctly when you're distributing a chalice to hundreds or thousands of people. So the church has has given two very good reasons that have now stood the test of time. I, I don't know exactly when that change he's talking about was implemented, but I mean, it several centuries, um, if so, not a millennium. Uh, just, just tying those two pieces together, I know you're gonna you're gonna bring up the counter example or the other example, but I would I would just underline the fact that those living at the time could have looked at that change and and felt like, well, this is inorganic or this is. For sure. This is overreaching. The and many did. The church overreaching. Yeah. Um, many did. But it wasn't arbitrary. At the very least, it wasn't arbitrary. Now looking back, because it was, it's it stood the test of time, we can look back and say it was organic. It was organic, authentic. Right. So maybe that's a better way. <laughs> maybe we've cracked the code. Maybe at, at the time you say, is it arbitrary? And then you only really get the definition of organic as the church moves forward. But so then the, the counter example, Gordon kept asking Flanders, you know, give me an example of something in the new mass that isn't organic. And Flanders, really, the, the main thing that he came up with is the removal of the altar from the first thing he came up with. <laughs> right. And, and the thing we sort of harped on. Yeah. Was the, the removal of the altar from the wall and put out in the center of the sanctuary. So it's more like a table. Now, I would argue, I don't know if that's an organic change. Maybe maybe in a hundred years, no church will have that and it will be seen as inorganic. But I would argue that that's arbitrary. So unlike the removal of receiving under the species of the wine, which we've just sort of proven and what the Council of Trent says is not arbitrary, I, I haven't read a, a good reason for why the altar was removed from the wall and become a table. You know, I don't, I, I haven't read a church document it doesn't talk about it in Vatican II. You know, I, I haven't read an encyclical about the altar being pulled away. The church didn't bother to define or give a reason why we did that. Furthermore, not only did they not give a specific reason, which is enough right there to call it arbitrary. Furthermore, it, it's entirely Protestant. The notion of using a table, a table is where you eat. An altar is where you sacrifice, right? And so Thomas Cranmer, when he was developing the Anglican liturgy, 
one of the first things he did was pull the altar away and make it a table. And instead of calling it the sacrifice of the mass, he called it the Lord's Supper or a meal or communion. He he emphasized the idea that it was a meal and and a communion, a community, rather than a sacrifice. Because and he didn't distributing believe distributing in... communion in the hand. These were right. all direct attacks on transubstantiation. Right, because the they priesthood. didn't they don't believe in it. Cranmer and, and the Protestants didn't believe in you know the Catholic teaching on transubstantiation and the mass as a sacrifice. They removed so much of the propitiatory language, right? Oblation and um th those kind of sacrificial imagery and words they were removing from their liturgy. So for the Catholic Church, you know, Cranmer is doing this in the 15 end of the 1500s, right? This late 16th century. For the Catholic Church then 400 years later to implement some of those same changes not only can you argue that it's arbitrary you can argue that it's protestant it's worse right? than arbitrary it's worse than arbitrary so is it organic i mean i would argue no but you could also I, I think gordon would make the argument we don't know but i think you can absolutely make the argument that it's arbitrary which goes against the the section of the catechism you just read and both of those guys would would hash this out better than I am. So I'm not trying to take anything away from them. We just didn't really get to it. We didn't get to the distinction between organic and authentic and arbitrary and all of that. But I just, I wanted, as I was thinking about this over the weekend, I wanted to pit those two examples against each other, right? It's very yeah. clear that taking the chalice away was not arbitrary. And it's very clear that the removal, the ripping away of the altar from the wall and making it a table is not only arbitrary, but like you said, worse than arbitrary. And um, so, so some counter argument would be that when the first instruction of the concilium came out, uh, uh, intero cuminici in 64, it said that the altar should preferably be freestanding. And the reason would be that the priest can, I believe it says in the document itself, can walk around the, the, the altar. So, in one sense, that wouldn't be arbitrary if they're given a reason for it. Well, they're given a reason. I'm glad you brought that up because that is a you know a document. And I just said the church doesn't have any documents on it. That that there is a document that says that. But that's a very weak reason, right? Why does the priest need to be able to walk around it? To incense. <laughs> I mean it I'm trying to play Norvis advocate. <laughs> no, I like what you're doing. I like what you're doing, but I think even still, you know, you can you can easily argue that well because the problem is in history we saw this removal so we're not just talking about high altars being you know separated from the wall so the priest can walk around because actually at my parish i attend it's a it's a high altar beautiful and then you can't see it unless you're on the side but you can actually walk around it that's a big difference from like these tables or just these stone things just set in like this round church setting that's i mean it just it just screams you know casual supper time sure. um so that there's a big difference like when we're talking about freestanding alders there's a huge um a wide range of examples but i think the point you're bringing up is we saw in history um freestanding altars communion in the hand were all used as attacks against doctrine. Right. Whereas the communion under one species was used to defend doctrine. That's right. And that's that's the difference. So right. yes, so, it's so probably arbitrary, would... but it's worse than arbitrary because it it diminishes the real presence. Right. And that's a good point about the the changes to the mass and the really Vatican II overall. It's funny because you just said you made a joke about calling it Trent II or Vatican III. And I think that's emblematic of kind of the problem in the church, right? The, when we called councils before, right, it was called the Council of Trent for a reason, right? Usually it's where the council is taking place. And if you do some reading in, in history, it's easy to see why a council would be called at that place at that time, right? Vatican II, it's like, it's just like a bunch of bishops in Rome, there's not really a particular reason. It's a pastoral council. They're not fighting a heresy. They're not defining a dogma. You know, so it, the whole thing kind of seems arbitrary. Hmm. And then the changes to the liturgy shortly after follow suit, right? 
it's just, we're just changing it. We're not really giving reasons. It's really all under the behest of one man, you know, Bugnini signed off by Paul VI. It all kind of seems arbitrary. The, the, the council itself all the way through the, the liturgical reform. Yeah, if not arbitrary, then worse than arbitrary, because it would be arbitrary to, to not do it for a very important practical reason or a doctrinal reason. Right. But if it's not, if it's, if there's a, a strong reason behind it, it's likely that it's worse than arbitrary. It's likely right. that it's an attack against the faith. And that's what's... And you see that with every with every development, right? So Gregorian chant is added to the mass, and there's this strong link to the Psalms and how David would chant and how you know chanting the Hebrews in the temple were chanting, right? So there's this strong link to to scripture and to tradition, right? And every change that's brought to the liturgy, right? Leo the Thirteenth adding the prayers at the end of mass had this vision of the demonic descending upon Rome, and you know we need to to pray against this battle, spiritual warfare. You know, there's all these reasons, really good, compelling reasons that every Catholic can get behind for these things being added to the mass. And it's like, well, the priest is going to face the people. Yeah. Why? And what's, what's interesting is you look into, so episode two of Mass of the Ages is getting into what they actually said. Like, let's actually look at what the architects of the new mass and Paul VI, what the bishops who gathered together, what they actually said. And it seems like arbitrariness was everywhere they would ask <laughs> yeah. questions like why do we need to say it twice like why can't we just say it once why do we need to do the the nine you know curia on nine times why can't we just you know i say it you say it i say it you say it. so they would ask questions without being able to answer them and then they would change it i'm so glad that you bring this up you're just you're leading me right into like <laughs> if i had a list of the things i wanted to say you're just like leading me right into them <laughs> So one of the things that happens all the time when I interact with, you know, people who have seen the film on social media, they bring up the chart we had in there about, you would, you know, the numbers better than I do about in the old mass, there were how many genuflections? Ooh, uh, genuflections. Yeah. Or signs of the cross, whatever. Signs of the cross, there's like uh, 52 signs right. of the cross. And then the new mass, there's, there's like, far fewer. Yeah. It's like so. Handful. people see that graphic or they see me talk about it in something on social media and they say, well, doesn't that seem kind of arbitrary? Like, so there's 52 signs of the cross. Wouldn't 60 be better? Wouldn't <laughs> 70 be better? And that's at first, that seems like a good point, right? That seems like a good counterpoint. But this is what Kwasniewski is always saying, right? The virtue of religion is giving God what he is owed. And God is owed what he has inspired the church in her tradition to give to him. Mm. Okay, so... Once you understand that concept, like, you know, 52 signs of the cross isn't arbitrary and more wouldn't necessarily be better because over the last 2000 years, the number of signs of the cross that the church has put into her liturgy through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and through many saints is 52, right? So it, it actually isn't arbitrary and more wouldn't necessarily be better. So when we show that graphic, we're not just saying, 52 signs of the cross is way better than four. <laughs> We're saying there's, you know, it's a lot more than four. <laughs> well, whatever it is, <laughs> whatever it is. Yeah. No, I mean, that, that's, that's what we'd be saying is like, look how cool we are with all yeah, that. We friends. make the sign of the cross we have more than 10 you. times more than you. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's not really the point. Although the, their side note, there is a point to be made about, you know, the efficaciousness of prayer and gestures have meaning, right? So yeah. It does matter when you genuflect and why you genuflect. Okay. But aside from that point, you'd have to have a reason. So you're, you're Bugnini and it's 1968 and you're developing okay, the mass. I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're Don't Bugnini. Play. Um, and you have these 52 signs of the cross that have been handed down for thousands of years. Why, why are you taking them away? What's your reason for that? And the most profound one, I think, when you go to the Novus Ordo Mass, so I, I'm a convert, and I, when I converted, I went to Novus Ordo. I had heard of the Latin Mass. I converted right after Samorum Pontificum, like three weeks after Samorum Pontificum. So it was like all the rage. <laughs> and my church started a Latin Mass right away. So I knew about it, but like many people, like people in the documentary, I thought it was just Mass, but in Latin. I didn't know there's anything different about it. So I just, I never really bothered with it. 
But when I started going to the Latin mass, the genuflection that I noticed the difference in, right? Because I don't have all the rubrics memorized. I don't yep. know every time a priest does or doesn't genuflect. But the time where I did notice it is right before the elevation of the host. In the Novus Ordo Mass, the priest says the prayer of the consecration, elevates the host, puts the host back on the altar, and then genuflects. And in the Latin Mass, he says the prayer of consecration, genuflex, and then elevates the host. And, and then that's genuflex. An, and then genuflex <laughs> again. And that's an important, important distinction, especially in the mind of the priest. Because uh, the church has always taught that the sure. moment of transubstantiation, the moment it, it transforms from bread to the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ is at the words, this is my body. So when the priest has uttered that in persona Christi, transubstantiation occurs, and then he genuflects. Because right then, before the elevation, everybody thinks that, you know, it's this big dramatic moment where you're raising bread up, and then once it's reached a certain height, God sends a lightning bolt down and it becomes the body of Christ. That's, that's not true. The elevation takes place because the priest is showing you this is the Lamb of God, right? Yeah. And so he genuflects before that because he's already acknowledging this is God. And that's a super important distinction. And you'd have to have a really good reason for removing that. That's right. And Sacred Sanctum Concilium, uh, which is the document that gives the principles for the reform of the liturgy from Vatican II. And this is such an important paragraph because, you know, if you're a, let's say you're a conservative bishop at the time who's voting on whether he's going to, you know, put this document through and you read this, you can understand why so many bishops voted for it. It says, finally, so in summary, there must be no innovations unless the good of the church genuinely and certainly requires them. Right. And <laughs> so that's not enough. Here's even more. Care must be taking that, taken that any new forms adopted should in some way grow organically from forms already existing. Right. I mean, so the burden of proof, the burden of proof that it is organic, that it is authentic. What was the first sentence you said? Something about it, it requires it? Genuinely and certainly, the good of the church genuinely and certainly requires these changes. Right. So the burden of proof of if it's organic, if it's authentic, and if the good of the church requires the changes is on the one making the changes. And it cannot be just a committee in a room with a whiteboard, like <laughs> coming up with a bunch of ideas and like, oh, this sounds like a great <laughs> idea. You know, th this sounds like it'll work really well. It's actually a more of a humble attitude, which you look at what, what has worked, what, right. what is a part of history. Because tradition is, in a sense, invisible to the one to, to us right now. Like we said about the limits of papal authority in regards to liturgy. In some sense, it's invisible to us. But when you look back, you see what is authentically part of tradition. Um, so it, it's not just about you get smart people in a room to come up with great ideas. It's more about you look. You would ask, well, this is actually a tradition that's a part of you know the Byzantine rite or something. Like it's it's a form, you know, already existing. So I think that's, so it's Sacred Sanctum Concilium 23. I think that's a very important. Yeah. Paragraph. So maybe the question, I mean, the, the debate we had was great and I'll leave it to dogmatic theologians to continue debating whether or not he has the authority, because I really don't know the answer to that. I, I think you, you kind of have to say yes, only because if you say no, you're, you're in a roundabout way calling a lot of the things about the Novus Ordo I don't know if invalid is the right word, but you're essentially saying that the Pope didn't have the authority to remove some of those things, which is not an argument that I, I want to make. Or Yeah, you need, a, you need another category like, OK, it's valid. It's licit, I think, <laughs> if. unless a, a future council, you know, looks back with ire upon it, then it wouldn't be licit. It would be overstepping his his uh, authority. Right. And there are four, you know, four qualities in liturgy. So we get stuck on validity and licity. Um, but you also have to say, is the liturgy fitting and is it authentic? Mm -hmm. Right. The church has it, long standing in her tradition has talked about four qualities of liturgy. And Kwasniewski writes very beautifully about this. And we get so stuck on, is it valid? Is it valid? Is it valid? 
And even if we move past validity, we're like, licit, you know, lyseity, is it licit, is it licit? And we never talk about authentic and fitting. And I, you know, I don't know if you can point to anything less authentic than adopting a Cranmer table. You know, what, what Thomas Cranmer 400 years ago used to absolutely destroy Catholic theology and the liturgy, we then adopted ourselves. And, you know, that is not authentic. That is not an authentic development in the liturgy. So we can get we can get stuck on the word organic, you know, all we want. But I think when you pair what you just read from Sacrosanctum Concilium with, you know, eleven twenty five in the Catechism, does the good of the Church require it? Is it authentic? I think it's it's very easy to argue no with just about every change from the Novus Ordo Mass. But ultimately, we don't know. <laughs> well. I think we do know. I, I think we. Have, I think we do know if it's authentic and if the good of the church requires it. I think we don't know if it's organic. Organic is the tricky. That takes time for the tree branch to grow sure. out, and we might not live to see that tree branch grow out. Yeah, that, that's that's tricky because I would I would have almost. You know, I would have near certainty for some of these changes in the Novus Ordo Mass being inauthentic, yeah. inorganic. Um, so I, I think we're on the same, we're on the same page with that. I'm just trying to parse my words correctly. So Father John makes a good point. Um, he said Vatican II made changes hoping to draw the laity of the time back to devotion. It wasn't arbitrary, but also wasn't successful. So I'm so glad that somebody said that. Yeah. So in one sense, it wasn't arbitrary because they, you know, the the primary and indispensable font of the church is the active participation in the liturgy. That's St. Pope Pius X. That's also repeated in Sacra Sanctum Concilium. So in one sense, it wasn't arbitrary. Um, I, I'll let, I want you to uh, tag team this for uh, in just a little bit, but I want to just underline that there are so many changes <laughs> that they cannot all be brought back to um, active participation. Now, sometimes active participation is used as kind of like a... <laughs> It cloaks everything. It's just like, yeah. oh, active participation. We can make any change we want. But um, for example, the ch the reason that Bunini, uh, the architect of the new mass, wanted to change so many of the orations. These are prayers composed by the church, like the collect, the uh, post communion. Uh, these prayers was because, and and I'm quoting him. He says, "No one should sp find spiritual discomfort in the church." That's his reason. We, we we change prayers that mention hell too much or the, the consequences of sin or this or that because people are spiritually uncomfortable with them. And then you might say, well, active participation. We want people to participate. So you see, the active participation kind of cloaks everything, and it's always like a trump card people can play. But there are so many – the point I want to make, there are so many changes that – they ultimately boil down to either arbitrariness, like personal opinions, or worse than arbitrariness. And that's exactly what I would respond to Father John. Um, I'm, I'm glad that he says this, because this is yeah. a point I hear all the time. Okay, it wasn't arbitrary. Their reason was, um, as Father says, they were hoping to draw the lady of the time back to devotion. Okay, it's worse than arbitrary. <laughs> So it's not arbitrary. They give a reason. They say they want to draw the lady at a time back to devotion. But then look at how they did that and look at the result. So so fine. Those those yeah, specific he, changes. He makes that point it also wasn't successful. Right. So when you're looking back on it, like we said, you know, the church moves slowly. When you're looking back on it, that's that's how you judge it. You know, you know it you judge a tree by its fruits. And if if a reformer comes to the Pope and says, you know, the I've talked to all the bishops and the laity. There's there's no devotion. There's all this revolution in the culture. We need to bring people back. And then the way they choose to do that makes it a hundred times worse. Okay, so maybe it's not arbitrary, but I mean it's worse than arbitrary. They made it they made it worse, right? And so toying with toying with people's spiritual comfort in the liturgy, as as Bugnini tried to do, is like you're 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 just in the wrong place, right? Mm. We needed reforms in the seminaries. We needed reforms in catechesis of children. I mean, Pius X was was um, 
reforming seminaries very harshly, asking people to say the oath against modernism and kicking out teachers and students who wouldn't do it in, in the early part of the 20th century, you know, 50, 60 years before the liturgy was reformed. So I hear this point all the time, but we needed Vatican II. We needed a change. It may not have been the right change, but we needed something. I'm not going to argue that that we didn't need any change at all, or we didn't need mm -hmm. any inspiration of devotion. But I am going to argue that the church went about it in entirely the wrong way. So using the argument, we needed a change to support the change that happened, <laughs> that, right. that doesn't work. That doesn't right. work. Yeah, I think that's a good point to bring up is what we're not saying as lovers of the mass of the ages um, who think it's the the foundation to the, the future of the church. What we're not saying is the Pope cannot change the liturgy at all, because that would be a weird, <laughs> I mean, that would be a weird position to hold. Just you'd have to call into question the history of the liturgy itself. Um, obviously he can make changes and that's probably the thing I'm afraid will happen with Pope Francis is starting to tinker with uh, the mass of the ages, start to change uh, little things. He, he already did this in the, the motu proprio, like you no longer say, need to say, you know, the, the readings in Latin, just say them in the vernacular. So he's, he's already starting to change certain things. I, I'm afraid that that is going to be the reality. Now, arbitrariness um, or organic, is, is it organic? Is it authentic? That'll be judged by the future. <laughs> right. What I have to do as a Catholic is just suffer well. And, um, but uh, that's a different question from, can the Pope just take the missile of 62 and throw it out? Right. Abolish it. That's, and we've been talking about those two things as if they're the same thing. Like we can look at an individual change and, and discuss whether or not it's right, organic, right. but can the Pope take a previously, like what Benedict the 16th says, a previously valid right and consider it harmful or unnecessary? Um, because I don't think so. How about this? How about this? Yeah. He has the authority to do that, but he won't do that. See, interesting enough, I talked with Timothy Gordon, and that's kind of where he lands. He has the, the authority, the but only if he has a good reason, it's not arbitrary, if it's going to be organic and growth, etc. all these things we've talked about, and it's not. So, so if he, he only has the authority in that situation... So the Holy Spirit will protect the church from that outcome. That's uh, my bet. That your position. <laughs> that's my bet. But I did want to make, um, I wanted to make one <laughs> final point about yeah, we got to wrap up here soon. Yeah, I, I just want to make one final point about something specific that Flanders and Gordon talked about. I actually prefer, I have a background in politics and a little bit in philosophy, and I actually prefer Gordon's line of reasoning, kind of making it legalistic and defining terms. But towards the end, Flanders said something that in most debates would just be kind of thrown out because there's no evidence behind it. There's no definition of terms. He said, just go to the Latin mass and you'll see what I'm talking about. And as somebody who, who grew up, you know, converted and grew up in Novus Ordo Mass, I lived, uh, right after I got married, I lived in the Diocese of Baltimore, um, which has, you know, every diocese has its own problems. But um, I, several times, I lived there for a year, and three times that I remember in a year, I left Sunday Mass in the middle of Mass to look up on my phone if what the priest had just done or said or made the congregation do invalidated the mass. Hmm. I've never had to do that at a Latin mass, right? Because like you said, it, it can't be toyed with. There aren't all these options. And so I think, although I prefer Gordon's kind of legalistic line of reasoning, I, I do want to lend some credence to what Flanders was saying. If you want to know what organic means or what authentic means or what fitting means, go to the Latin mass. And, right. and just experience it. And that's kind of the call we make with our films, right? Show the beauty, lead with beauty, and just get people to just try it out. I mean, I'll be honest, I didn't like it the first two times I went. I, was, I didn't know what was going on, even having studied it, because I had studied it for a year before I actually attended the first time. Hmm. And even knowing what I knew about it, I did not like it. It, it took a couple times. But now I just think, you know, if, if everybody can just get their foot in the door, two, three, I think, 
you know, from what I hear from people on who interact with us, I think about three times at the average before it really starts to sink in that this is mm. something different and profound. So I, I just wanted to lend a little bit of credence to that, that argument from Flanders. Yeah. And my summary is that, I mean, you said you judge a tree by its fruits. Now we can unite the analogies and say that a future council is going to look back on this time, the 60 years after Vatican II and say, okay, the fruit of that tree was got cut uh, off. Yeah. It got, it was, <laughs> they it was cut off all the fruit. Uh, the, you know, so many branches were removed that it couldn't bear fruit. And they're going to judge this time period for us. Um, now we can have these discussions and these debates. We, we're by no means shutting off our reason. Like that's why we're actually having these debates and discussions. But ultimately this, this time period, the Pope's, the limits to papal authority in regards to liturgy, these just have to be borne out in time. And I think you'll judge a tree by its fruits. I think people will just see this time. The bishops of the future will see this time as a great failure in the church. And what went wrong? Well, the liturgy, which is the heart of faith, which is the, the summit and source of our faith, um, which is the foundation to our faith, Lex Serrandi, Lex Credendi, that was changed to, to such an extensive degree that we, we have to recognize that as the culprit, as the, um, the heart of the problem. But you know what? I'm excited for that because all of my favorite saints, uh, just about all of them, lived right during or after the Protestant Reformation. I mean, so many great, mm -hmm. great men, great saints, great families are raised up in times like this. And so, you know, it might be, it might be hard to make these decisions and have these debates and find a, a reverent liturgy for your children, but you know, it's worth it. And that's right. And our children are going to be better off for it. And I'm, I'm very hopeful about, you know, we're, we're 60 years into this. Um, you know, that's a generation I'm very hopeful for what the next generation and especially the generation after that will look like. Yeah, me too. Um, Awesome. Well, everyone, thanks for joining us this beautiful morning. Uh, we, we wanted to just jump on in a very casual way our thoughts on the debate. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find out about episode two and everything we're doing, go to theliturgy.org, get notified. Uh, we don't send a ton of emails. We send emails that are very relevant and authentic and fitting and <laughs> <laughs> organic. Our emails are so organic. You'll love them. <laughs> um, anyways, yeah, uh, just go to our website, find out about what's going on. A lot of people have questions about episode two. We also did um, uh, a live stream about episode two. So if you have questions on that, you can find it on our channel. So many of our Watt uh, viewers have not subscribed yet. Please go to YouTube and subscribe. We're almost at a million. A million views. Yep, that's right. Uh, so th thanks all for your support. We really appreciate it. Couldn't be doing this with this without you guys. And this is the best job ever. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Have a, have a good day, Jake. Thanks, Cameron. Appreciate it. God bless. Bye.